In a move to enhance government efficiency, President Bola Tinubu has directed the implementation of the long-awaited Oronsai report. This decision, part of the resolutions at the second Federal Executive Council meeting for the year, includes mergers, subsumptions and relocations of various government agencies. Our State House correspondent, Adesua Moran, has more on this and the government's plans to restart direct payments to households. The RSIA report, commissioned in 2011 by then-President Goodluck Jonathan, aims to eliminate redundancy in the public service. Chaired by former head of the civil service, Stephen Oronsoye, it proposed merging and abolishing various government agencies to streamline operations, reduce costs, and enhance efficiency. However, these recommendations remained on paper for 12 years, with successive governments failing to implement them. Today, the Federal Executive Council, chaired by President Bola Tinubu, has decided to act. So in a very bold move, today, this administration under the leadership of President Bola Ame Tinubu, consistent again with his courage to take very far-reaching decisions in the interest of Nigeria, has taken a decision to implement the so-called Orosaye uh, report. Now, what that means is that uh, a number of agencies, commissions, and some departments have actually been scrapped. Some have been merged, while others have been subsumed. Others, of course, have also been moved from some ministries to others where government feels they will operate better. How will this impact job security? The whole idea is not to throw people out of jobs. This is not the whole idea. The whole idea is to create efficiency and also make it possible for government to sell funds where necessary. Notable mergers include the National Agency for Control of AIDS, merging with the Center for Disease Control, and the Federal Radio Corporation merging with the Voice of Nigeria. Additionally, agencies like the National Salaries, Income and Wages Commission will be subsumed into the Revenue Mobilization and Fiscal Commission. Hadiza Bala Husman, the Special Advisor to the President on Policy Coordination, provides an extensive list of affected agencies, highlighting that a committee chaired by the Secretary to the Government of the Federation will ensure swift implementation. The committee would look at the administrative restructuring and also the legislative amendments required to ensure the full implementation of the recommendations. The other aspects of um, recommendations that have also been passed to the committee to relook at. It's important for us to um, appreciate the bold um, approval granted by Mr. President at the Federal Executive Council. This has been um, a recommendation that has been, I think, in the Nigerian discourse from 2012. Um, we're here in 2024 and it's so been approved and the aspect that are applicable to mergers, as I said, subsuming and scrapping and relocation of agencies are those that have been so considered arising from the totality of the panel report. Amid economic challenges, the special presidential panel reviewing the National Social Investment Programme has submitted its report to President Tinubu. Led by the Finance Minister, the panel recommends the immediate resumption of direct payments to households, targeting 12 million households and 60 million nine However, questions arise about how identified issues will be addressed for proper beneficiary verification. What we're looking to do here is the triangulation of this data set to ensure that not only are we using uh, the register that is properly, properly been, been uh, uh, populated, but that we also do proper verification of every individual that will benefit from, from that investment, uh, that social investment program, which means we will give commitment to ensuring that no one is paid twice because you have to be properly ID'd before you can benefit from, from that program. The, the beneficiary, their account, their NIN, their BVN, and of course at the end of the day, where the payment actually lands, the account or the um, mobile wallet, 
So that's the big difference. This time, it is with integrity and with uh, transparency and accountability. Approvals reached at the meeting extend to other sectors, including works and education. We had the, the approval of uh, FIC for the construction of 700 kilometers of coastal route running from Lagos through the nine coastal routes or states uh, up to uh, Cross River. The Federal Executive Council's actions on the Orosarian report signifies a shift in Nigeria's governance. However, the key now lies in meticulous implementation and sustained oversight to ensure transparency and accountability. From the presidential villa, Adesua Omoruan, Arise News. Joining us now on the morning show as we review the Oronsai report and the tripartite presidential economic advisory team put in place by the Tinubu administration is Professor Ken Ife, member, governing council, Ministry of Finance, Incorporated, Morphe. Professor Ife is a London Enterprise Ambassador and Chief Economic Strategist at ECOWAS Commission. Good morning and welcome to the morning show. Oh, hi. Good morning and thanks for having me. Thank you, Prof, for joining us. Well, 12 years later, we're back to the Onosaye report. We we'll have a lean government. Uh, what do you think of uh, President Chinubu directing immediate and full implementation of that report? Is it possible? Well, immediate first of all, and full. I think uh, it's a bold step. Yeah, I think it's a bold step and uh, is a show of uh, political brisbaneship. Actually, when you look at what has happened over the last few days, the president has released some pressure valves and, uh, and they are very necessary because if you hear various descriptions from different uh, people, there's some people think that we are sitting on, on a keg of gunpowder, something that we are also sitting on a bed of you know, a, a hotbed um, of inflammable objects. There's some also even put it to the fact that we are likely to move, if nothing serious is done, we are likely to move into a holy month of discontent. So what the president has done is to release those valves. First of all, it started with ECOWAS to turn the table on ECOWAS on humanitarian grounds and let them go uh, in terms of measures that they are taking. Of course, those are economic, not, uh, not the political side of it. Then, of course, here on the Orosanyo report, um, it hasn't been, it's not being implemented in full, but it is important that we have started it. Um, and I can tell you, uh, I've been part of the, the debates in the last round on this, where I'm, I can say I'm really happy that Fiscal Responsibility Commission was not subsumed to uh, revenue mobilization. Um, and and I, I, because that, they are clearly uh, coordinated, they both have coordinated uh, jurisdiction. And, uh, and one is looking at how you share federation revenue, and the other one is a, is a brainchild, an institutional arrangement for Fiscal Responsibility Act 2007, which also works with the ex equivalent in the state. So they are totally on different orbit, but the names sounded alike. So I wasn't surprised that they were banded together, but they were totally on different orbits. Then, of course, we know that the whole objective is to begin to do something about reducing the cost of governance. And I think this is the first major step. And people are looking for signals. Everybody's looking for signals. The market are looking for signals, as you will find when we talk about the economic advisory team. Uh, opposition are looking for signals. Everybody's looking for one kind of signal or the other. That is a signal that government seriously wants to address the issue of cost of governance, reducing or controlling the cost of governance. But I must say that is not the end of it. That is actually the beginning because by the time Orosanya was looking at this, it was about four, 541 agencies or something. Now it's even over 900. So uh, the, the committee will have to continue. It's work in progress. But it's important that we fire the first shot. So I could see that this is the first shot. And then because there are areas of um, common agreement, and then there are areas where there are disagreements, and then there are areas. So that's why it kept on for so long. But let's start with the ones that we, we all agree need to happen and then progressively keep looking at the matter. So the committee's work has not ended, it has only just started. 
All right, so the committee's work has only just started. Now, Professor Ife, a number of people are a bit skeptical about this announcement. And you would understand that because this is not the first administration to be making this kind of announcement in terms of um, an implementation of the RSI report. What, what, number one, what is different about this, if you're convinced about that? And then the second thing is, what must be put in place? I know you've highlighted a few things, but what are some of the things, some key or critical success factors to be put in place to ensure that this doesn't go the way of old announcements made about an implementation of this report? Well, this has already been agreed, and the action is, has been taken yesterday by the announcement. What is um, important about this is, if all these agencies were generating revenue, I don't think anybody would have bothered about that. And if they were generating revenue and, and they're retiring those revenue to consolidate revenue fund, I don't think many people would even have bothered. But the state of the matter is that many of them are on the expenditure side of our balance sheet. Uh, and that's why we need to scrutinize them. And then uh, even when I mentioned uh, Fiscal Responsibility Commission, its work is to pursue some of these agents, many of these agencies that are revenue generating, and make sure that they return money to the uh, consolidated revenue fund. And we're having serious issues in, in, in that implementation. Of course, there's an amendment that is currently on the table, seeking to put more prosecutorial powers uh, on the FRC and give more sanctions and really be very clear about is either you pay one million or you go to jail, or if I both. So those are enforcement side of it was the weakest part of, of that uh, FRA 2007. So that has been addressed. Now, in terms of uh, the implementation, what I have got to say is this. It costs money. Whatever you want to do, if you want to fight corruption, you have to, it costs money. You may want to fight it by bringing some IT systems that are going to make sure it costs money to do those. If you want to merge and retire people, it costs money to retire them. So, you know, we have to always be conscious of the fact that anything you want to do costs money. So we have to be setting money aside to be able to deal with the ramification. Of course, there will be natural wastage. So you may not, have, you may not be recruiting into these structures, but there will be natural wastage. Of course, as people retire, you don't have to replace. And as they merge, you will see some savings in the measure, and then you have some more efficiency. But all of those will still have to be funded. So um, it, it's still work in progress in that respect. All right, Prof, good to see you again, sir. And always a great time, you know, to listen to your elucidations, oh, thank you. Prof. This is Rufai here. Uh, prof, since the last thank time we had the Arosari, and at first, the Arosari report itself is not even fit for purpose any longer. It's obsolete. The last time we had the Arosari report, we had 541 uh, MDAs. Today, we have 1,316 and counting because Southwestern Development Commission <laughs> just passed a second reading in the Senate. There are many <laughs> government agencies that are still passing readings and about to be created. So it's no longer, and as I said, there were parameters, there were benchmarks. To cut 220 government MDs, we're going to save 860 billion naira. Today, we don't even know the benchmark of how many are you going to cut to save money. Number one, what will you suggest? A holistic review about the cost of governance itself. Secondly, in 2017, uh, President Oshibajo, acting President Oshibajo, signed an executive order as regards transparency in these MDAs, you know, to be able to pretty much like cut the cost of government too. Because that was what the executive order was all about. Ensure that taxes were properly evaluated, levies and things like that, and the MDAs, waivers and all of that, you know, to be able to make them fit for purpose. But that was not implemented. Should we revert to even making them, you know, more nimble, more agile is the word in the first place, more revenue prone than any other thing. And why do we even need a pilgrimage commission in this country? We are, not, we are a secular state. Should we be subsidizing religion? I mean, Prof, it's on you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, very, very, very incisive questions, actually. The thing is that when Parliament, or oh, sorry, when our uh, National Assembly keep on bringing new and new acts. They always have an institutional arrangement for delivering those new acts. And but what they don't do is to review areas of concurrent jurisdiction with the existing act and then use the, it's only in the finance act that you have, annual finance act, that you progressively amend other acts. And then, you know, but that is not the approach that National Assembly takes. So that would have been helpful. 
So what you now have, you have a multiplicity of them as they are coming in and then, you know, and you, you don't do all that due diligence of finding out the extent of overlap between the new is what you are creating and what auxiliary persists and where, you know, so that wasn't, wasn't going on. But now you, you, we, we, have, we are now faced with this. And I did say that this is work in progress because the fact that a few have been pushed across the uh, table doesn't mean that it's ended. We are actually just starting because the numbers, as you said, are doubled. The number of them are doubled. Then as to the, so there is, there is clearly different objectives. Overall objective is to reduce the cost of governance. But the aspects that concern um, duplicity, efficiency, and all of that is, is one part. The other one that is the second part is about revenue. You know, who is, what, who, what contributions are they making to the revenue? Because if they are fit for the purpose, they should be able to generate revenue. And if you are generating, are we actually seeing that money? The fact of the matter is that we believe that at least half of the uh, money that the government needs uh, could actually come from, from these MDAs if they were actually remitting all their money. And, and the, the, the regulation and the law supporting this area is what we call Fiscal Responsibility Act 2007. And we are pushing and pushing for the amendment of this act because good as it is, it talks about transparency, about accountability, about prudence in the management of uh, uh, public resources, and has so much guidelines on where you should borrow, what you should be borrowing for, cost benefit analysis to ensure that what you are doing is, and very, very clear, you can only borrow for a capital project and human resource development, which is, a, uh, which is education, health, and employment. And all of those, so many provisions in there, but the enforcement was what was lacking. So you scream and scream and scream. Normally by that same law, it says the, the entities must return 80% of the operating surplus. World Bank helped us to develop operating surplus template. I have gone around many, many uh, uh, MDAs training them and even uh, Qatar General's office and all that. I trained a lot of these people, even virtually and, and, and physically. And there's a big gap there between what is expected of them and what is coming through. So that now we push our resources to let's get the Senate and the National Assembly to pass the amendment. The amendment is now going to say, if you, if you do the wrong thing, you go in straight away. It's not about, oh, I was directed to. There's nothing like directed to. If you make that mistake, you are going in. Whoever is collaborating with you is going in as well. And it is one million naira fine and jail, not all, is and. So the whole thing, but start implementing that. And, uh, and that is what is until you get to that level where you begin to implement. Nothing sends a, a better signal to, to, <laughs> to this MDA than one or two people have gone to jail for one or two things that they did wrong. And then, um, and then everybody sits up. Because if we are getting all that revenue, nobody will be talking about this. But we are not getting those revenues. Well, Prof, well, first, um, I like your point about cost. Because indeed, cost will be involved. There will be gratuities to be paid. Even something as basic as letter-headed paper will have to be changed. And all of that will cost money. But the government is saying that, oh, in this uh, immediate implementation and full implementation, people will not lose jobs. In 2012, when the Onosai Committee submitted its report, the report stated that about 102 heads of parastatals and agencies would have to go, who have to lose their jobs. Not to talk of people working in all these uh, MDAs. Now, what uh, can this government do to make sure that at this time of economic deprivation, we don't add to people's burden while trying to save cost of governance by making people lose their jobs? Because inevitably, they will lose their jobs. And then secondly, where will government find the money from? to fund the implementation of the Onosai report? Well, I'm not sure many Nigerians are bothered about whether they leave the job or not, to be very honest with you. It is about whether you give them the entitlement so that they can go and start life. Some may do better than being in government. Uh, they may want to do business. And there are lots of businesses to be done to feed 225 million people. So it is about how ready are you to give them whatever they're entitled to so that the next day they can set up shop and they can start doing things with their, with their things. And there's, there's a lot to do. Um, but that money has to be found you know, in the same way. And it can be found from the savings. So what happens is just like we, we have to deal with the issue of uh, uh, subsidy. And they stopped it. 
and then began to use the conceived savings in, in addressing all the other yeah, fallouts. So that is the same. And secondly, you may say, okay, we know that we are going to have savings in efficiency and all of that, but let's have a fund that will deal with this. And then you raise a fund, a fund of 300 billion or 200 billion, and then obviously uh, you, you plan how to retire, retire that. So that, that is not uh, uh, un, un, unusual to, to do that. Um, so the savings, of course, you, you, can, you, can, you can see the evidence uh, over time. Then I'm not sure what other issue that you raised, but I think um, those are the ones that come to my mind straight away. Yeah, it was basically about the cost and whether government will be able to find the money and people losing their jobs. And you say that mm. doesn't matter. People can lose their jobs. They should go and find something else to do. I hope that applies to no, everybody. No, people are not afraid. Of, I, I tell you, at even, the, no, even the retired people, their groups is that they, uh, they could do some. People are retiring at a very young age. 60 years is, is a very young age. In the UK, we are retiring from 70. It used to be 60, 65, 70, now 75. People are happy to go through that. But now here, how can you retire a 60-year-old man? He's got, I'm 69. Are you telling me that I'm not functional? You know, give me what I'm entitled to, and then I'll go and find my way. And that's what people are worried about, that they are going to wait for a long time as if you are doing that to let them die while they're waiting for their benefit. Give all that benefit. And you can raise money for this. You can raise a bond. Uh, you, know, you can have something in some intervention resource which, which provide that bridge for you to begin to let people go and do what they need to do to survive rather than hang them in the system, get them off your payroll, and then nothing comes to them. And that would be very, very unfair in their respect, in their view. All right. So, so and the other one is, of course, I, I hope it's um, there, are budgetary, there are budgetary positions right now. Even this, they all have budgets right now, and, uh, and those budgets are meant to fund large expenses. So as you, as you, that could be, I mean, you can go back to the house and review some of that budget and put some of that to, to, a, to a fund where you can use to, to retire some of the people who opt to. But you know you have to plan this because you have to give people the opportunity to choose whether they want to early retirement, take early retirement, and then how, what is the consequence, financial consequence. And then there will be the natural wastage, people you know, already living on their own. So, so you, you have to be planned and the people giving a choice. Mm -hmm. And over time, you will find out that when you are giving people money, some who have said no may turn and say, yes, please give me the money. I can do better things with my life than this. All right, talking about committees and road to economic recovery, the president uh, just the day before had also set up the Economic Advisory Committee, and I'd like you to, I'd like to get your thoughts on this as an economist yourself in terms of how do we, how do we begin to recover the economy? It's a tripartite committee, um, federal governments of nationals and the private sector, and a few um, known faces, they're including um, economist Bismarck Rewani, some governors of the, um, in, the, in Nigeria, some industrialists, um, Chifaliko Dangote, we had Tole Lumelu there, and a few others. I'd like to get your thoughts on that. And do you think that this is the right move I mean, tackling what he's said, economic recovery and also food security as well. It's an excellent move. I know without doubt, we can't take anything away from that. It is a market signal. This is, one, we are, this is a market signal that says to the market, just hang on, we are going to the bottom of this. And then you see the president saying, I don't have answers, so you tell me. And then you know the central bank governor said before many times, there's no magic wand. So it is the, the highest state of, you know, I want you to talk to me. So it's not coming to read a speech to people and then tell them thank you very much and they walk away. No, they want to talk. So the framework, for example, for the beginning, the framework is a very, uh, you know, very, is a partnership framework which is inclusive of all the strategic and local players that are uh, actors that are necessary. You have the captains of industries, you have organized private sector. You didn't just replace one for the other. You have the two because they're speaking to the, the bigger spectrum. And then you also have the key sector champion, which is oil and gas. You have uh, manufacturing, you have finance and banking. So these are the, these are, it's, not, it's like 20% of the, of the key active sectors. 
representing 80% of the entire economy. So that is what, you, what you've got there. Then, of course, you have the national and subnational bringing the state. And we've always said, get the states involved. This economy is in the concurrent uh, legislative list. So we should not be acting like, look, get them involved. And then you've got the likes of uh, Soludo again, who wears so many hats, being in there, and some other governors, and then, you know, we've okay. got the complete picture. I would excuse okay. the civil society that is not there, but invariably, okay. the actions will reach okay. them in some respect. Okay. So it is, but the process is also the, a very good one. It's an open process, it's inclusive, it's transparent, and, uh, and okay. you are going to see them. As they all came out, they were all saying different things, but okay. all add up to the openness, the... Okay. the, the Oh, so sorry, Prof. Just, just finish up before I ask you the next question because of time. I hear That's time right. is fast spent. You said the process is open. Prof, sir. Yeah, I'm saying the process is open, transparent, inclusive, and, uh, and, and accountable in the sense that people want to account for the, for the thing. And the, the advice they were given were very honest advice. When people, I, we, they were interviewed. Dangote was interviewed. Elumelu was interviewed. All these big boys were interviewed and just listening to the collection of their views that they felt empowering. They felt that they were consulted. And they all admitted that we were hostage to speculation and all kinds of misbehavior. So they, they've admitted those. And they okay. are the ones that will help us uh, okay. unpack the situation that we are currently facing. So okay. it's, a, it's a very good move. Okay. I mean, so it's only that the vice president is supposed to lead the economic, you know, council. And we had this too in the last administration with President Buhari, but we see it didn't materialize, you know. But I'd like to ask you, you keep on talking about signaling the market. I don't understand. Because also in, in communication, there's something called mixed messaging. And I see a lot of mixed messaging from this administration. I'll tell you how. We're talking about the Orosan Air report today to cut cost of governance. Didn't President Tirubu know about the Orosan Air report when he had about close to 50 ministers? Is that not increasing size of government? Because that's the mixed messaging. You have ministers standing. Also, the reproduction of many functions. So take, for instance, there's something called Empower. That's sort of like a graduate employment scheme that was stopped recently by the humanitarian ministry. But the Ministry of Finance is now saying that they want to start paying unemployed graduate money. And you have an empower there that was stopped at a point. So can you just quickly speak to all of it? I hear we have one minute. So sorry, Prof, I, because the time is fast spent. Can you just quickly touch okay, on that's, this? Okay, that's, that's fine. That's fine. Mixed message. Look, this, this governance is a moving target. It's a moving target. The president went with 1,000-something number of people to Saudi Arabia, I think, something like that. Very shortly, he changed and they said, look, no more than three people, five people, 10, 20 people, you know, he changed. The, the president had 50 ministers, yes, but when we have started this implementation, he may turn around and say, you know what, I don't think I need as much as 50. So, so it's all a moving target. So we have to understand that if he had a magic wand, he would have taken one decision and then stood by it. So the man says, you know, I don't have the answers. So he, the thing that he has is he has a listening ear. And he does listen. And whenever he does listen and something is brought to his attention and he thinks he has a nose for the answer, he goes, he goes after it. So I think well, we have to prof. give him that, that space. Um, to, yeah, that's what I think. Well, Prof, the problem with the moving target is that you end up confusing the people. And hence, many people ask, where is the economic roadmap? Is there a document to that effect? I don't know whether you have seen one that, you know, gives clear focus rather than this moving target. You know. Anyway, we would like to thank you very much for joining us on the morning show.